Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about the physiology of the stomach, and we mentioned that when mechanical and chemical digestion of the contents of the stomach is complete, we have this substance called chyme. Okay? So chyme is going to contain really anything that came from the diet. It's going to contain really carbohydrates. It's going to contain lipids. But remember that the stomach's job is really to break down proteins. Okay? And the breakdown of those proteins is done in combination with hydrochloric acid and the activated enzyme pepsin. And so the stomach is going to facilitate squirting of this chyme into the small intestine. Okay? And then we're going to have further chemical digestion in the small intestine. And so when we look at the small intestine, we're going to see the functions are a little bit different. Rather than being chemical digestion and mechanical digestion, as it were, in the stomach, the small intestine's function is going to be chemical digestion and absorption. Okay? There's a little bit of absorption that occurs in the stomach, which we'll mention here, but really not a lot. The vast majority of absorption is going to be in the intestines, in particular the small intestine. So now we're going to talk about the anatomy of the small intestine. The small intestine is divided into three regions of unequal length. That's very important. Um, when you first learn about the small intestine, it's easy to fall into the thought that they're equal lengths. The duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, the three regions, are actually all different lengths. So the part of the small intestine that exits from the stomach, that is, that is distal to the pylorus, this is called the duodenum, or sometimes you'll hear it pronounced duodenum. Uh, this region is only one foot long, okay? And there's a lot of chemical digestion that occurs here. We'll talk about how that occurs when we look at the accessory organs of the small intestine, okay? But essentially, a lot of chemical digestion occurs here, and then there's also some absorption that occurs here. Absorption of nutrients into the blood, and ultimately that stuff will go toward the liver. We'll have a separate video where we talk about that in more detail. Okay? Now, after that one foot, then the small intestine gets a second region called the jejunum. Now, the jejunum is really the next eight feet of the small intestine. And for the most part, the jejunum is superior to the ileum. Okay? So this is the jejunum kind of in this turquoise color over here. Okay? Now, the jejunum is the next eight feet of the small intestine. There is some chemical digestion that occurs here, but the vast majority of the absorption occurs in the jejunum. I'm going to blow up this picture real quick so we can take a look at this. Um, you'll notice here that there is some stuff absorbed in the, du in the duodenum. Um, there's a lot of ions absorbed here. And then, of course, we see a few water-soluble vitamins such as thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, biotin, and folate. And then there's all four fat-soluble vitamins can be absorbed uh, in the duodenum. But what we see here in the jejunum is there's a lot more things absorbed here. Okay. We see the vast majority of the water-soluble vitamins, all the fat-soluble vitamins, a lot of these um, just minerals, ions, and then lipids, monosaccharides, amino acids, and small peptides. So there's a bunch of stuff that's absorbed in the jejunum. Okay. Um, and that's kind of important to understand why. Why would we absorb monosaccharides and amino acids and, and lipids here? It's because really the chemical digestion for the most part is occurring in the duodenum. And even though there's some absorption there, we have to break that stuff down before it can be absorbed. So it's broken down by the time it gets to the jejunum. So then the jejunum's major function is going to be absorption. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. All right? If we then go further from the jejunum, we then it turns into the ileum. Okay? So the ileum is the terminal region of the small intestine. This is the last 12 feet. So this is going to be the longest region of the small intestine. Again, there are some other things that are absorbed in the ileum. Uh, we see here that we have some water-soluble vitamins, a couple of the fat-soluble vitamins, um, D and K, and then there's some other minor things. Also of important note, we see in the terminal region of the ileum, notice it's the terminal region, we have reabsorption of bile salts and acids. Um, we're going to discuss... Uh, those a little bit when we talk about the physiology of the small intestine, but essentially bile salts or bile acids, these are important in fat digestion, okay? And it turns out that they're reabsorbed in the terminal part of the ileum, okay? So those are the three regions of the small intestine, the duodenum, 
the jejunum, and the ileum. Now the ileum of the small intestine is going to converge with the large intestine. And we'll see when we talk about the large intestine specifically, the uh, ileum is going to combine or merge with the cecum of the large intestine, which is right here. Okay? And it's going to pass through something called the ileocecal valve. But again, we'll cover that in the large intestine video. Now recall, we had a lot of chemical digestion in the duodenum. Okay. The stomach didn't take care of all of that. Okay. It took care of some of it, but the vast majority of chemical digestion is going to be in the duodenum. Now, the duodenum cells, the cells that line the lumen, some of them do make their own enzymes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But a huge amount of the chemical digestion is done through enzymes that are made outside of the duodenum. They're made in what's called the pancreas. Okay. The pancreas has exocrine glands that make and secrete digestive enzymes and bicarbonate. Now let's talk about why we would need those. The digestive enzymes are of course for chemical digestion in the duodenum. And there's going to be enzymes that digest carbohydrates, that digest proteins, and that digest lipids. That's obvious. But why would we need bicarbonate? Remember that bicarbonate is a base. It's alkaline. The purpose of secreting bicarbonate into the duodenum is to neutralize the acid from the stomach. Remember the stomach had a pH of about 1 to 2 with all that hydrochloric acid. If we just simply dumped that acid into the duodenum, first of all it would probably kill all these enzymes, but it would also damage the lining of the small intestine. So the pancreas exocrine glands, in addition to making and secreting digestive enzymes, will also secrete bicarbonate into the duodenum to neutralize all the incoming stomach acid and also keep these enzymes functioning optimally okay, for chemical digestion. And the way that the pancreas is going to secrete these substances into the duodenum is basically through something called the pancreatic duct. The pancreatic duct is essentially going to merge with the common bile duct and become its own duct, and you're ultimately going to squirt those secretions into the duodenum. We'll cover that in a separate video. A second accessory organ of the small intestine is the gallbladder. The gallbladder's function is to store a bile that's actually made in the liver. So the liver sends the bile to the gallbladder, and then the gallbladder is going to secrete that bile into the small intestine, specifically the duodenum, um, for fat digestion. Okay? This is also going to be something we cover in a separate video. But I wanted to point out these three organs so that you know that the small intestine doesn't do all of this by itself. It has to have help from the pancreas, this is mainly for the chemical digestion, and then help from the gallbladder and the liver. The liver makes the bile, and then it stores it in the gallbladder, and then the gallbladder secretes it into the small intestine. And remember that bile is, of course, for fat digestion. The only other anatomical thing I'm going to talk about is that, remember from very early in Anatomy and Physiology 1, the tubing of the small intestine is all interconnected through this meshwork called mesentery. Now the mesentery is that web-like structure, okay, you can go back and watch my video on mesentery, but the mesentery itself contains blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. So when we ultimately absorb things, especially in the jejunum, but also in the duodenum and ileum, those absorbed substances are going to move through the venous system to the liver, and then also fats are going to be absorbed through small lymphatic vessels. What we're going to talk about now is an intro to the physiology of the small intestine. We're going to have some separate videos where we talk about the pancreatic enzymes in more detail, and then another one where we talk about what's called the brush border enzymes. Okay? But first, let's just think about this. We have nutrients incoming from the small intestine. Those are in the form of chyme. Remember, the stomach squirts chyme into the duodenum of the small intestine. Okay? Now, the small intestine itself is going to release several hormones. Okay. Those are secretin, cholecystokinin, or CCK, GIP, and VIP. Let's talk about the stimulus for release of each of these and what they do. So the first two hormones that are released that we'll talk about are secretin and cholecystokinin, or CCK. So these two hormones are going to act synergistically to do two primary things. One, they're going to stimulate the pancreas exocrine glands to release enzymes and bicarbonate into the duodenum. That makes sense because we've got nutrients from the stomach, as in chyme, that's being squirted into the duodenum of the small intestine, so we need to start putting in some enzymes to break that stuff down further, and then we need to release bicarbonate to neutralize that stomach acid that comes with the chyme. 
That's, that's why that makes sense. But also these two hormones are going to inhibit gastric acid production and motility. Think about it like this. If the stomach is releasing its chyme into the small intestine, the stomach is more or less going to be empty then, right? So if the stomach has already released its chyme into the small intestine, does the stomach need to be motile again? Does it need to be mechanically churning? Does it need to be producing stomach acid? Well, no, it doesn't. The stomach's function is kind of finished in this. Now we need to work on the small intestine, so don't waste energy on the stomach. Stop producing stomach acid and then stop being motile. Okay? We're now in the small intestine phase. All right. The third hormone we're going to talk about is GIP or gastric inhibitory peptide. This hormone is going to have some overlap with these two in terms that it inhibits gastric acid production and motility. So again, for the same reason, we've already finished with the stomach's function. It squirted its chyme into the small intestine, so the stomach's more or less empty now. It doesn't need to be active. So we're going to turn off gastric acid production and make the stomach stop being motile. It doesn't need to do mechanical digestion anymore. Okay. But also GIP stimulates insulin release. And why would we want to do that? Well, we're feeding. We're eventually, as this stuff moves through the small intestine, going to have absorption of amino acids and glucose into the blood. And so we're going to need to start making insulin to prepare for that because otherwise the glucose in the blood would just skyrocket after absorption. So we need to prepare to get that glucose into the blood. And so GIP is going to stimulate insulin release. And the final hormone we're going to see is something called VIP or vasoactive intestinal peptide. This one's going to function differently. So think about it like this. The blood vessels that are actually going to drain the small intestine, okay, these blood vessels are going to be capillaries of what's called the superior mesenteric vein. Okay? We're going to talk about that in much more detail in another video. But the superior mesenteric vein and its branches are responsible for draining the small intestine. So any nutrient that's absorbed from the small intestine is going to have to go through the superior mesenteric vein, ultimately to the hepatic portal vein, and then to the liver. So if you want to have maximal absorption of those nutrients, okay, you need to get blood flow to the small intestine, right? So you need to vasodilate the arterioles that lead to the small, really, and large intestine. Both of those things need to happen, okay? And as long as you're getting maximal blood flow to the small intestine, you're going to have maximal absorption. Now, specifically for the small intestine, the blood vessels that you'd have to vasodilate in order to get increased blood flow to the small intestine would be the superior mesenteric artery. Okay. Uh, for the large intestine, which we'll cover in the, one of the next videos, that would actually be the inferior mesenteric artery. And then, of course, it's going to be the superior mesenteric vein that drains the contents of the small intestine and allows absorption of those nutrients. All right. So superior kind of goes with the small intestine. The inferior is going to go with the large intestine for the most part. There's a little bit of overlap. All right. But in any case, that vasodilation is going to be accomplished through the release of vasoactive intestinal peptide. Now, with all four of these hormones, there should be a stimulus for release. And generally, the stimulus is going to be approximately the same with minor differences. It really is just going to be the chyme entering from the stomach into the duodenum of the small intestine. But it's going to be different aspects of the chyme. Now, let's imagine the chyme in the, in the stomach. What would be in it? What's going to be entering the small intestine? Well, there's going to be partially digested proteins, right? The stomach doesn't completely digest them. There's still going to be peptides, uh, even large peptides, and in some cases, proteins that really haven't been digested much at all. There's going to be triglycerides and fatty acids. There's going to be free amino acids. There's going to be glucose. There's going to be starch polymers, right? It's going to be a lot of stuff in here. And of course, because acids in the stomach, there's going to be H+, hydrogen ions, that come in from the stomach. And so there's going to be different triggers for each one of these hormones. For example, secretin is released in response to acid from the stomach. That's the major stimulus for secretin release. Because after all, the chyme is going to be highly acidic. So hydrogen ions stimulate the release of secretin. Cholecystokinin, or CCK, its stimulus for release is going to be free fatty acids, triglycerides, or TGAs, and free amino acids, right? So as we'll, as we'll see later on, cholecystokinin is going to trigger the pancreas to actually start releasing exocrine secretions into the duodenum. 
and it'll also have some effect on the gallbladder as well. Uh, gastric inhibitory peptide, or GIP, its stimulus for release is going to be free fatty acids, triglycerides, and actually glucose. So a little bit different than cholecystokinin, right? That's GIP. And then VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, its stimulus for release is just going to be simple distension. So rather than being a chemical uh, stimulus for release, VIP stimulus is simply distension of the small intestine wall, that is of the duodenum. So when you have things enter from the stomach, that's going to cause stretch of the walls of the duodenum, and that's going to trigger the release of vasoactive intestinal peptide. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense with the functions of each of these hormones and then also the stimulus for their release. Right? In the next video, we're going to continue our discussion of the small intestine, and we're going to talk about the various enzymes that ultimately digest the nutrients in the small intestine and facilitate absorption. And we're going to see that there's two classes of these enzymes, pancreatic enzymes and brush border enzymes. So please make sure to join us in that video, and make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.